Thank you so much for coming. My name is Cynthia Miller and I'm part of the POG crew. Um, there's uh, snacks, there's a, a QR codes for donations at the front table. We are getting so updated, I can't believe it. Um, and they've updated the space and that the only electrical outlets we can use are either right here or above your head. So we're turned around more than we usually are, but that's how life goes. ATC. Anyway, it's very nice to see you all here. And uh, this is a very special evening because this is a book launch for two of our very favorite POG members and writers in Tucson, Johanna Skipsrit and Charles Alexander. Um, and we also have with us Joanna's um, resident artist who um, did a beautiful job photographing that figure for the front of the book. I don't know if you photographed it, but it's... It's not my claim the whole thing. Claim the whole thing. Okay. I'll talk to your agent. Claim the whole thing. Okay. Anyway, we're we're very lucky that you're all here, and we're very lucky we get these fine writers to present to us this evening. Um, Puck's schedule for the rest of the the spring is uh, coming right up. Let's see. This is a almost April, isn't it? April 27th, we have poetry and music with Andrew Levy and Janice Lowe. And that, I think, is also going to be here at the Steinfeld. And uh, if you like piano music, please come. And poetry, the combo is so good. And that is our last event, I believe, till further notice. I can never say it's really the end, because poets do come through town, and we like to be available. Um, anyway, thank you so much for coming. Our big supporters now are Poets and Writers, Inc., which is a great organization that funds um, readings, mini grants, um, the Arizona Commission on the Arts, um, the Arizona Foundation for what is it? Tucson and Southern Arizona. I would like their old name better. Um, in any case, and all of you, uh, we couldn't do it without you. We wouldn't do it without you, <laughs> frankly, put it that way. Um, so tonight, first, Johanna will be up, and someone's introduced you. Yes. Thank you again for coming. Thanks for being here. So I'd like to introduce Johanna. Johanna Skibsrud is the author of three previous collections of poetry, three novels, including the Scotiabank Giller Prize winning novel, The Sentimentalists, and three nonfiction titles, including The Nothing That Is, Essays on Art, Literature, and Being, and most recently, Fool, a study in literature and practice. An associate professor of English literature at the University of Arizona, Johanna divides her time between Tucson, Arizona, and Cape Britain, Nova Scotia. So, for Medium, from the award-winning writer Johanna Skibsrud, Medium shares the lives and perspectives of women who, in their roles as biological, physical, or spiritual mediums, have helped to shape the course of history. Helen of Troy, Anne Boleyn, Shakuntala? Yeah, okay. Debbie, Hypatia of Alexandria, Marie Curie. Medium interprets the voices of women vilified over time, silenced by famous husbands, forced into sex work, or wrongly accused. Reckoning with the dominant historical narratives of each woman's era, Skibs Rood underscores the power of poetry to bring about new formulations for understanding the relationship between past and present, self and other. These deeply resonant and performative poems use language as a bridge across experience, sensibility, and time. Each exploration begins with a brief vignette inspired by the Vitas that once began manuscripts of the troubadours. Both Vitas and poems provide lyrical re reinterpretations of real and imagined elements in the lives of scholars, scientists, computer engineers, mystics, entrepreneurs, artists, nurses, and other leaders. And then we have a little bit of praise. Sybil like Skibs Rood uses each of her subjects, Vitas, as springboards for creating the kensos that make up the wonder that is medium. Each of these women's voices becomes audible, their bodies fully fleshed, their emotions and essence masterfully articulated. This collection presents an entirely novel means of actualizing the troubadour paradigm. It's a gift one can enjoy unwrapping for a long time. 
each time finding something new. To read these poems is to enter a world of beauty and meaning. What we have here is the work of an extraordinary poet. That's from Beatrice Hauser. And here she is. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you all for being here. This is just, yeah, really, really special. And uh, to see so many beautiful, familiar, and less familiar, um, but still friendly faces coming into the room. Thank you so much. I'm going to begin with the Sybil. A voice is an opening, nothing more. A hesitation between breath and word, idea and form. A hesitation that seizes, that takes hold. As the flickering of a flame, a sudden gust of wind, a brief embrace. They've come. For centuries they've come. In the name of peace, of war, of love, and of bitterest revenge, I've been entreated. For centuries. Heeded and ignored, flattered and defiled, scolded and praised. I've been approached at every hour, from every angle, by every manner of men of whom I can say only this. There has been very little shame. And yet still, they come slowly, are careful not to look me in the eye, and know enough to whisper as they beg for directions to the entrance of hell. Still, they need a door, a mad woman, a way of marking the distance between my voice and theirs, between language that speaks and the sound wind makes as it whistles through the cracks and hollowed stone, between what exists, what is, war. Fierce war, I say. I see the Tiber, the Euphrates, the Yangtze, the Nile. I see the Mekong, the Volga, the Gila and the Mississippi River all running with blood. Go ahead, call it something. Give it a name. That which glides like a wave that never breaks or a horizon that can never be drawn. That which has no point of view. It cannot therefore be entered, let alone exited, let alone measured or claimed. Still they feed me on bulls from the field raised corn in the blood of their own daughters and sons. Still they need a door, an entrance, and permission to enter, an exit, and the idea of return. They need a finger to point with, and rage. They need a body, and a hole in that body. They need to hear the wind whip through my open jaw. Look, you here, lingering at the chipped rock of the open door, afraid like all the others. Listen to the wind and to the voices outside, to the train, <laughs> to animals in heat, gulls in flight, children laughing or being born. Smell the stench of meat on the altar, of wood burning, of the dampness of grass, after summer rain. Feel the pangs of hunger and the first tremors of love. Taste salt and bread, fear and longing, blood, water, wine. I cannot reveal any more. I can only address you, you who have come, like all the others have come. So that's the Sibyl. That's the opening poem, the collection. And, um, you know, like uh, Nikki shared, you know, this, this collection is just, you know, a um, 
sort of a compilation of, of different voices, personas um, that's paired, they're all paired with uh, fitas or accompanying like um, brief biographies that sort of set the historical stage, the context um, from which the voices emerge. Um, the project began uh, 10 years ago uh, when I was pregnant with my, my daughter, Olive, who some of you know well, and, uh, um, and I would just start thinking about that time, about you know, just the different ways that we carry history and we, we pass on, you know, the, the really, you know, the lived physical material embodied ways as well as, you know, um, you know the, the, the more, you know, seemingly abstract ways that that happens too in terms of, um, um, you know, what we can share and transmit um, um, through spirit, through our intellectual work, um, for our emotions. And uh, so, yeah, I went down a lot of different paths um, exploring these different um, histories and voices, and it became this book. And it's a book that, you know, is as, as much about um, potential proximity as it is about distance, um, kind of moving between um, those and using the, the form of the lyric as a, as a mode of, um, yeah, hopefully some contact um, intermingling of of these histories and um, and sharings, and um, I wanted to say, yeah, I guess to as an illustration and to to kind of set up the next poem that I'm going to read, I'll just say that um, I well the the poem is um, is going to is is a, sorry <laughs> just wondering yes this is the poem I'm going to read. Mary Milan. Mary Milan is a, um, a figure that's probably most uh, familiar to folks, not as Mary Milan, but as Typhoid Mary. And uh, um, the reason why I've, I've been talking about this this poem a little bit as like illustrative of the book, because um, you know she was a figure, as you'll you'll find out in a moment, that was really you know unaccepting of her own responsibility or of um, in the the deaths of the the people who you know she transmitted typhoid to, and uh, so I'm thinking about this this uh, uh, this poem in particular as a kind of metaphor for the book in the sense that um, you know her story sort of draws attention to the ways that we are connected to one another and the impacts that we make um, on one another in ways that are often invisible to us at the time and that we don't necessarily recognize but um, the story of Mary Milan really makes it quite palpable um, that there's some you know a a aspects of our connectivity in the world that we don't we, we fail to recognize um, so, so Mary Milan. This is the Vida. 1869 to 1938 was better known as Typhoid Mary. And she immigrated to the United States from Ireland at the age of 15. She worked as a cook for well-to-do families, often serving her signature dish, peach melba. After several members of the families that employed her died of typhoid, Mary underwent extensive testing. Though she exhibited no symptoms herself, it was finally concluded that Mary was a carrier of the disease and therefore directly responsible for the victim's deaths. These findings marked a turning point for researchers and immunologists, but Mary herself never accepted them. Even after her release from quarantine on the condition that she never work as a cook again, Mary returned to her accustomed employment and her signature dish. The recipe, uncooked and served cold, quickly and easily transmitted bacteria. When more deaths were linked to typhoid Mary, she was detained again, this time for good. Still healthy and believing herself innocent, Mary Milan spent the rest of her life in quarantine on North Brother Island, a small island in New York's East River. The poem's called, Don't Touch Me. Don't touch me. Don't ask me to explain. Look, I'm an honest woman. I'm healthy, strong, and every penny I have, I've earned. Don't touch me. I come recommended. Don't ask me to explain. It kills them every day in the slums. Did you know that? The Lord spoke. He said, I will send the pestilence among you. But he didn't say how, and said nothing of exempting the residents of Fifth Avenue or of Oyster Bay. Don't touch me. 
He kills them every day in the slums, but I am not one of them. I am healthy, hardworking, clean. I come recommended. Don't touch me. Whatsoever plague, whatsoever sickness there be. We used to go down to the garden. We used to watch the souls of dead folk hop about like rabbits at the edge of the lawn. They were among us. We were not too high and mighty then. And if one of them knocked on the door, we opened it. And we're not surprised to see only darkness there. We were afraid, yes, sore afraid. But we did not think we should be otherwise. And if anybody died, we raced to touch the hand, to put the hand of the dead on our skin because we were innocent. Because we were innocent and alive and God-fearing. Because we prayed mightily using simple words and never once questioned why our prayers went continuously unanswered, which they did. Don't touch me. It's a simple recipe and good. I am no murderess. I am a healthy, honest Christian woman. I trust to God to forgive the rest. You cut the peaches in half, remove the stones. You boil them in syrup, then let it cool. Don't touch me. He kills them every day in the slums. I am no murderess, never been laid up, not even one single day of my life. I come recommended. Don't touch me. I told you, I know how to handle a knife. A dreadful loneliness slips in, slides its hand beneath my skirt, rubs its cold fingers down my spine, jabs them between my ribs, down my throat, inside my ears. Don't touch me. If there be dearth in the land, if there be pestilence, it is not mine. Don't ask me to explain. It's simple. Only give the fruit some time to cool. I am no murderess. There is no word you could invent, no instrument so fine or so far-sighted. Don't touch me. It seeps in. Don't ask me to explain why death pursues me like any other living thing. It is not me you fear. It's the knock at the door. The magpie's mad chattering at the window pane. Don't touch me. I am not that invisible thing. I stand before you, an honest Christian woman. If there be pestilence, I pray mightily, use simple words, and know not to question why my prayers go continuously unanswered, which they do. So that's Mary. <laughs> um, I'll do one more before I then introduce my friend, Nikki, um, uh, to come on up um, and, uh, and share some more of the, the poems. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a really important part of the, the project for me. And as I hope that you can see from what I've shared so far, I really think of them as performance. Um, and um, as I write in the preface, that I hope that they'll be read out loud. And um, so it's a really such an honor um, to be able to uh, um, invite Nikki um, up to, to also to share and be a medium for, for these, um, these poems, um, just as her work is a medium for the ideas of them by gracing the beautiful cover of my book. So I'll, I will um, I'll read one more, and then I will introduce um, Nikki. And so this next poem is um, a, you know, kind of explores another form of invisibility, um, which is another sort of theme of uh, women who have kind of gone unnoticed in their fields, especially in science. Um, and, uh, and this is a, a poem um, for Annie Easley, 1933 to 2011, a mathematician and rocket scientist who began her career as a human computer, performing complicated calculations for researchers in longhand. Despite the discrimination she faced as one of only four African-American employees at her first lab, she continued to advance her career and pave the way for future generations of women working in the fields of science and technology. Among her many pioneering achievements, she developed code used to research alternative power and energy conversion systems and contributed to NASA's Centaur rocket program. 
which laid the foundation for the Apollo moon landings. We were computers officially. We were computers officially before there were machines. When the machines came, we were technicians. When the men came, we were ladies, girls. On weekends, we drove down to the Cape, watched the Delta rockets and the Centaurs fly. We bought peanuts and popcorn. There was always a crowd. Later, I read about the real Centaurs, the ones they named the rockets for, about how they got stuck between two worlds and were often angry because of it. They didn't seem to belong. A lot of people don't know this, but there were female centaurs too. I saw a picture of them once, two female centaurs, one of them with her face rubbed out. That's just history, I thought, looking at the rubbed out place where her face should have been. Winter, I go down to the slopes, pretend I was flying, coming in for a landing on the surface of the moon. I'd look at all the little stunted trees covered with snow and squint my eyes so I wouldn't recognize the familiar shapes of houses and buildings and roads. I'd sail right past them, watch the lights think on in the lodge and in town and think of them like little stars. You have to see things like that from a distance, the way a computer does, a machine. You have to trust that the answers are still coming, though you can't see the way that they're being worked out. That all the problems have been broken up into little bits and become invisible, or at least temporarily unseen. So I'll just share um, a, little, um, a little bit. Hope I'm, yeah, I'm going to share a little bit. <laughs> um, that uh, uh, just is actually from an interview that I just um, had the opportunity to do about the book, and they asked me, they were really interested, in, of course, as everybody would be in the, the beautiful cover art. Um, so the first interview question is all about, like, how did you meet Nikki? And, um, you know, what does the, the cover um, art uh, mean for the book? So I thought this was a fabulous way of introducing Nikki to you tonight, and to also, you know, if you haven't got a chance um, to look at the, the, the costume that's here live in person, um, uh, <laughs> In person, I think I like that, right? Um, <laughs> um, it, uh, you know, go and, and meet it. And uh, so I met Nikki shortly before I left our shared hometown of Tucson, Arizona, to study clowning in France back in 2018. There weren't a lot of people I could talk to about what I was doing back then without their eyes glazing over in nervous confusion. But when I told Nikki about the plan, it was the opposite. Her eyes immediately lit up, and we've been friends ever since. As an actor, as well as a visual and performance artist, my interest in exploring um, in exploring vulnerability and sorry, sorry that, that does make sense in a sentence, but um, uh, so my interest in exploring vulnerability and audience contact through clowning made immediate sense to Nikki. And she was already familiar with the pedagogy and history and performance strategies I was especially keen at the time to learn more about. When I got to know more about how all of that informed and in various ways manifested itself in Nikki's work, I felt the resonances between our different projects and approaches even more clearly. Even though we work in different mediums, we share, I think, an energetic, fairly undisciplined curiosity. I mean that in the most, of course, exciting um, and praised, um, praised, yeah, sense of praise, um, curiosity about the world, as well as an interest in finding new ways of paying attention. Because of this, I really can't imagine a more representative image for medium than what you see on the cover. One image from Nikki's ongoing multi multidisciplinary The Ghost Walk series, featuring costumes Nikki created from found materials, mostly garbage, collected from, quote, liminal, transitory, and forgotten urban spaces. She says, the purpose of using garbage is to transform a discarded and weathered object revealing it as a thing of beauty that evokes shared memories and transcends the ordinary. Nikki's Ghost Walk series is an effort to recognize first and then to explore what she points to as our vast capacity to weather tragedy and trauma through transformation. It is my aim, she writes of the project, to create work that touches on this innate understanding of what is shared by all of us. The ghosts reclaim power through myth and ritual, giving the residual energy left from history a new voice. 
I couldn't ask for more or better for my own ghosts. Nikki Berger Mar Martinez is a Tucson-based artist and educator working in found object sculpture, film, photography, performance art, theater, land art, and placemaking. She holds her MFA from Yale and her BFA from Carnegie Mellon University. She spent her early career in New York City and abroad studying experimental forms of theater with Anne Bogart and the City, is it SI, City Company, and the Trinity La Mama Performing Arts Program, the Fordham Orvieto Theater Institute and the Work Center of Jersey Grotowski and Thomas Richards. Her sculptural work is currently part of the Tucson Museum of Arts Biennial. <laughs> it's still going. <laughs> and has been seen at the Steinfeld here, where we are, as part of the of creation and isolation, cultivate Tucson and Zero. She is a recipient of the Brooklyn Arts Exchange Space Grant and recently completed an artist in residency at Catalyst through SAACA with her company Chaos Theater. She currently teaches acting at the University of Arizona, and she is here tonight. So thank you so much, Nikki, for agreeing to, to be a, a medium of these poems. Yeah, I'm so happy to be one of many mediums for this beautiful work. Um, so this is, I stood before myself and reached out, and this is the Vita. A mystic from the 14th century, Lalashwari, or Lal, dead, grandmother, wrote short imagistic vatsuns, or vaks, a word deriving from the Sanskrit vakan, which means simply voice or speech. Through her verses, Lalashwari celebrates, celebrated the possibilities of non-dualistic language and thinking in an effort to break down perceived boundaries between selfhood and the divine. I stood before myself and reached out to know myself. But each time my fingers closed around something or someone else, my skin was thin. But nevertheless, it proved a barrier. I could bring nothing closer. Because no matter how hard I pressed, the thing I pressed against, pressed back. Everything looked back at me with the face of another. I felt hunted, alone, perhaps inexistent. As brittle as a wayward and wayward as a leaf, I blew and blew in little circles inside myself until at last I came to rest at my own feet, unrecognizable. So, that it was only by chance that I picked myself up as if I was another. By chance, I closed my fist around myself and turned to dust in my hand. Sure, some of these names. Your mom was helping me, but I don't know. So this is I go out every morning. Natalia, I should have asked you about this before. Oh, I have to see it too, but it's an honest. I'm just gonna pretend like I know. Natalia Reshtevsko. No. What page is it? Resh. Reshetovskaya. Yes. Reshetovskaya. Oh boy. 1919 to 2003. Was a Russian chemist, twice married to Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Thank you. Who typed the secret manuscripts that would become Solzhenitsyn's many published stories and novels. When, in the name of gathering material for his art, Solzhenitsyn began to conduct extramarital affairs, his relationship. <laughs> with Reshtevskoskaya <laughs> deteriorated. In 1970, the two divorced for a second time. Solzhenitsyn married the mathematician Natalia Svetlova, and the newlyweds moved to the United States. 
soon after the Gulag Archipelago was published to great acclaim. In her memoir, Rzeszowskaya wrote that she was perplexed by the way that the West accepted her ex-husband's writing as the solemn ultimate truth and argued that its value was, as a result, wrongly appraised. Despite this criticism and her own subsequent remarriage, Rzeszowskaya admitted as late as 2002 that she still loved Solzhenitsyn. It's possible that it may seem strange and even improper to someone, but alas, I love him right up to this moment. And the thought never leaves me. Will I really never see him again? I go out every morning, sometime just after 10. I like to walk at that hour. It's the familiar rhythm of it, the tip-tap, tippity-tap of it, that soothes me, that gets me out of my head. Of course, they're wild for him now in America. They take everything so literally there. They don't know you can't. Just like that. Rub the life from one surface to another simply by pressing it up against a page. They don't know. The stories went right through me. I can still feel them sometimes. His voice in my ear, my fingers on the keys. It's been a long time now since I've written anything down. At least I stopped wishing I was that other Natalia. I wouldn't say it was love now, exactly. Unless everything is love. A way of touching or wanting to touch upon what isn't and can never be yours. In America, see, there's only the future to consider. But over here, everything is history, or a way of becoming it. Sometimes I dream that my fingers are moving across the keyboard again, only there are no letters on the keys. It's just my fingers and no alphabet, no scroll of paper in the feed. It's just tip-tap, tippity-tap. Like the sound of sh the sound shoes make on concrete when they're going somewhere just to turn around and come back again. It's just words. It's just words. Stripped of meaning, literal or otherwise. Stripped even of unspoken things. It's for art's sake, he used to say in order not to explain. Well, all right. If life is art, a way of making something from nothing and then slowly breaking what's been made. Well, in America, of course, they are wild for him. They believe every single word. Let them. The stories went through me just like they went through that other Natalia. There was no substance to them, nothing to believe in. They filtered through us, like light through leaves. Thank you so much. That was, yeah, I mean, I guess you can all kind of imagine how that was for me was just a thrill to hear the words come to life like through another another voice. Thank you so much, um, Nikki. I'm just going to close um, with with one poem, and then we're, we're going to take a break, right? Is it, yeah, probably. Yeah, I feel like. Um, shall we take a break after? Yeah. No. Oh, oh, oh! We're not going to take a break. I'm so sorry. Okay, but um, <laughs> um, we're going to just power through. But can you can can we do one more poem? All right, um, and uh, this is a, a, a poem, you know, kind of a, a, a tribute or a celebration um, to, you know, that, what 
just we had the opportunity or I had the opportunity to, to have happen the sharing this like bringing to life of this performative dimension that I really wanted to explore with the, the, the poems and so this um, last poem is um, uh, inspired by evoking um, the voice of Franca Rama um, and I'll read you more about her in a minute but um, before I close with the poem I just um, also wanted to um, say that how happy um, I am. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna cry. I'm not gonna cry, but to, to, that, that my mom is here. <laughs> and, oh my goodness, I did not expect this, but um, but uh, the, the book is dedicated to her and to my aunt, uh, Ellen, who we lost in December, I'm so sorry. And, um, but I was just talking to, um, to my uncle just today, did he tell you about the dream that he had? So he just had this dream, and uh, he said, I just, you know, um, Ellen came to me in the dream, and she said, I can only stay a brief time. I can only be here for a little while. He said, well, oh, thank you, thank you for being here, because I just really wanted to tell you one more time how much I loved you, and I just thought that was such a wonderful dream, and um, a real sort of illustration of like what I hope um, this book in some ways, you know, kind of, you know, demonstrates or reminds us of, of just, you know, even again, like those invisible germs. We, there's <laughs> all <laughs> these things that we just don't understand in these ways that we're connected to one another um, that, yeah, that, that are just beyond us. So, um, what luck to find myself is the, is the poem. And uh, this is Frank Arama, 1929, 2013 to 2013 were her dates. She was an Italian actress and playwright who, born into a theatrical family that could trace their roots back to Commedia dell'arte days, made her first appearance on stage at the age of only eight weeks old. Together with her husband, Dario Fo, Rama wrote and starred in countless productions, performed to sold out audiences in union halls and sports stadiums, imagine. The shows sought to entertain, raise awareness about political and social issues, and foster a sense of solidarity among the political left. In 1997, Fo accepted the Nobel Prize in Literature. He accepted it on behalf of himself and his wife, who he emphasized was an inextricable and elemental force within everything he wrote. What luck to find myself like this, lit up, a single speck at the end of a long and narrow beam. What luck to be at least briefly illuminated, a mode of dust, a coagulate, caught, lit up, to find myself at the end, no, to be that end, a particular body, a mouth, a way of opening. What luck to bite down and find there really is something out there to sink one's teeth into. What luck to see or begin to, in perfect darkness, the becoming of teeth and lips, the glare of eyeglasses, to hear in silence the becoming of a laugh, a shout, to reach out and grasp or begin to, the becoming of something to seize or be held by. It has to be this way. You have to invent absolutely everything. You have to dream it all up, make it real. You have to let your hand hit on something when it reaches out. You have to give your word something to catch against. Thank you so much for this evening. Beautiful, the two of you, just beautiful. I could see you on this tall stage, spotlight, have that whole thing memorized. You know, be like Greek breeding, kind of a beautiful setting for that. Anyway, here we go. Moving on. Okay. Um, Charles Alexander is a poet, an essayist, publisher of Czech's Press, contemporary poetry books for all of us. He also um, 
is a letterpress artist, a writing teacher, a baseball enthusiast, father of two, and my partner for the last some 30 plus years. We're here to celebrate the publishing of Time Being. The latest, most recent poem started during the pandemic. Uh, through that time, like all time, it continues. Charles is also the author of Hopeful Buildings, Arc of Light, Dark Matter, <clears throat> Near or Random Acts, Certain Slants, Pushing Water, At the Edge of the Sea, Pushing Water 2, Truro Shift, and several chapbooks available through small press distribution in the Bay Area. If you have never looked at their catalog online, please do. Just like his other works, this book deserves to be sung. For it is in the sound and the resonance of the words that forms a welcome to our sensibilities that makes us want to step into these poems, to follow the path through families, through gardens, light and luck, open as the day or the night, where we might find ourselves wondering and wandering face to face with what we love or know. It's not just my opinion. The late great poet Lynn Hoginian once wrote, thinking is the experience of everyday living, and Charles Alexander's work is a poetry of thinking. But it is experience, not difficulty, that wonderfully completes these poems and brings them very close. Joseph Lees writes, I can't think of any other poet who writes with such playful vitality, creating a fullness of representation. Oh, that would make better, sorry. I can't think of any other poet who writes with such playful vitality, creating a fullness of representation that embodies consciousness, presence, passion, and compassion. And Will Alexander also praises the efforts of this book, citing a delight in language always turning in the prisms of invention and observation. I'll try to beat the train. <laughs> I still call it a read aloud book of the time. I call it an album of songs played soft, played loud. Time being has short poems, haiku, dedications, and borrowed phrases, catchy tunes we forgot we were humming. to share our dumplings. Time being is full of singular moments, states of being, or occurrences that have no fixed duration. We find that each thing touched by words is part of something larger, something unseen, and very present. Fluid and inclusive, it feels like now. Like Dogen said, that old Buddhist, and in the Shobo Genzo he writes, for the time being, I stand astride the highest mountain. For the time being, I move in the deepest depths of the ocean floor. Charles writes, we sleep within the music, the desert music, the insane, sensate music, where the dance begins, and we attend, bound into a hole by the poem that surrounds us. Charles Alexander. Wow. <laughs> Uh, thank you all so much. It's, uh, thanks to Pog, thanks to Arizona Quarterly, thank you Nikki and Joanna. That was just amazing. And uh, for me, how nice to be in this building again, where I couldn't count how many poetry readings we've had here, but even working as an artist, I know I go back here about 28 years and Cynthia goes back farther. By the way, it's her uh, painting on the cover of this book, so it's, we have some sym sympathetic things going on here. Okay, I'm not going to say too much about the poem. I'm going to read a poem called The Last of the Pushing Waters, which is not part of my sequence, Pushing Water, but it is certainly related to it, and, uh, and it's the longest thing in this book, but it has room to breathe, you know, and, and I think it gives you room to breathe, and it's just very key, not only to this book, to I think my work as a whole, 
and uh, it also uh, began after some deep reading in the late poems of uh, William Carlos Williams, uh, particularly uh, The Desert Music and Journey to Love. And if you don't know those works, we'll just leave right now and go read them somewhere because they're, they're amazing. Um, so if you hear me call uh, to doctor, he was a doctor, and that's who I'm talking to. I'm not talking to Doctor Who, but if you want to think I'm talking to Doctor Who, that's all right. No, I like him too. <laughs> the last of the pushing waters. Until it's not the last. Because doctor says so, says there are no perfect waves. Though we have lived our lives by water, by wits or by accident, yes, by accident or wave, and perhaps there are no accidents either. Either or, and the space between. We have lived our lives by water. Whether the deep blue of the Pacific with its mighty lives of whales and waves and survivors, Ishmael among others, Ishmael among the letters and numbers, or rivers mostly dry and mostly sandy, the Rito, the San Juan, and the Canadian, the longest tributary of the Arkansas, begins in Colorado and at various points, sand pits along the banks witness acts of love and the migrations of birds, such as cranes. Cranes move in waves, and we live by water. A few creeks or washes, wet or dry, because we find ourselves both wet and dry, in and out of rains, in and out of other sorts of tears. Here the poem washes up and washes us, because Without the poem, we have steady drips, but no pools, no lives that speak of life we could not live with. I cannot live with you, nor live without. Now the waters in the canyon recede. But the blooms are full on, full on in orange and white and purple and pink and red, colors of canyons, colors of love's imaginings. No, no hope if not a coral island slowly forming out there among the waves, the crash of the waves. Among, of, blue, crest, old and new, bright reflection broken with branches and time. Come home, how, white and erect, sweet it may again and again. Start again with accident an apology. Once upon a leaf, who was there when I placed the leaf upon a doorway, a leaf inscribed with words on an autumn day in California's cool East Bay for a friend to find, a poem to find, and love to find a way, make all things find a way. A way and a wing and a wave gather and disperse the last of the pushing, the last of the falling waters gather and disperse in warm April, in the years not quite beyond disease or desire, disperse and gather, desire and contract, now release. She flies, she flies again, a small hawk waits for her return, and across waters and lands and waters Time, wisdom, and koalas wait for other returns, other time, other, or is it the same? Love and water, love of water. Sometimes the spirit rests in the darkness of the body. Sometimes the spirit finds no rest before flight. Sometimes find tests and marks of wear in the swirls of leaves by wind again leaves in autumn in a college town after one kind of loss, one life's loss. Life a series of asymmetries and pronouns and gathas and twenties and forties and works of light in the water and out of the water. What did he see before in the worrisome light of a verb phrase or a nova or a no sir 
other than the constant yes of love of the poems, when dreams were not, and dreams were as air. We live in a time of hydration, whether one is drinking water in order to live, or another jumps from a boat in order to live where boats and waters define and transcend borders and honors. Is there honor? Is there honor in a word, a glance of light? Oh, love who places all where each is. No, that's too easy, or maybe it all simply and decidedly should be easy. And we just consistently fuck it up with degrees of concern, contempt, or tempos, confused and fused. The foot is variable, the word variable, the line variable. And when we set it in stone, we deny a force. But when we set it in type, we augment a force on paper and in paper. And remember that paper begins in water as though grace could save a language in the dirt on the other side of air. Where a strange man turns forgetful, not in a line or a foot or a variable motion, in short, he wanders. And the lettering of the wandering becomes a map of locations, a map of tessellation, a map possibly of love, possibly other. He picks up a book again places stones again, walks alone, though not abandoned, no matter what the child may imagine. The intention or the accident depends on the way the hand reaches through water, always past all accident, penetrates or begins to penetrate. Again, all the cracks, the crevices of a world I will hate to leave, an earthly paradise or as much as one might have of one. The full and partial colors given by one love, one woman through the years of those same and utterly strange waters. Shared pictures of vessels, pictures of chairs, pictures of snow through car windows, pictures of windows and urban spaces in New York and Paris and home. Home again where a blue deer finds us. But no, not even the prospect of leaving can lead me to bring this to a close. What does not close is the will to open. Open the will, open the door, open the floodgates, and we would if only enough water can be found. Go about it the slow way, if you can, whether it be money or water, honey or mustard. The opposite of all is dearth, a dearth of earth may be something to prescribe against, something to prescribe in spite of, something to describe in, something less than meters or light years. He said, I am a poet, I am, but where does that and a dollar land you? What land does it bear? Not so dire as the sea remains is there in its profundity to admire and to warn. See, weeds and as murmurous where murmurs are interruptions of heartbeats in the young and in the old, in cases where kindness only begins. The process, lucky to begin in the middle of an ocean, triple lucky with such love amid the blue. They were kind to me there and in the midst of past dust bowls along Route 66 and towns named Burns Flat and Dill City and Weatherford, as though the weather might be forded, as though we might afford the weather, even if everything twists in the sky. The leaves are very green, Doctor. My friend, my teacher, my companion on a day early in a century of rising seas, rising heat, rising migration, where migration only previews what we all will know. The race is on and it looks like tumbleweeds through what once were meadows in which bare feet ran. One cannot plan the poem, no. It happens in one's blinking moments, in one's mind and in the world we imagine. But we only imagine what we make, have made, and will make. 
May we have enough strength to keep the weeds at bay. Many proclaim what leads us astray, and we cannot pray or go away. Not today. No, not today. Journey to love, perhaps, with everything open to the rain. Remember that New York day, arriving at a conference of A and the and 80 flowers, sopping wet from the trains and the streets, removing socks and shoes to hang and dry on racks while we told stories of words and piled up stones of words, left for lunch and return, left for air with Simon and did not return. That kind of openness to turn and return and not take much stock in stockpiling eloquence and addresses to rack up degrees of achievement. The words are best kept in poems, most explosive there, most wanting, most saving. In that great storm, pitiful leader, could you even then outshout the room, outshake the storm? Go down, go down, Persephone, go down, Korah, go down, Isis, go down, Jason, go down, Odysseus, go down where the edge of the sea leads to some new turning, some new slouching, some new light, poem, love. I have been close to the mountaintop and at the edge of the sea, and in your land of color, scratched and brushed and wept into paper. Inside that color, we are one and not one. Inside the scratches, we are two and not two. Inside the brush and the tears, we sit, hands in a soft circle, eyes cast downward, spines straight. We may catch a light, catch a word, catch fire, catch air, catch a breath, which is a chance. In the crater, which also lay inside those colors and brushes, we lay under a plethora of lights as though pinned against the bottom of a bowl, where at the top the lights played with the universe, subtle visitadora, cherry blossoms illumining the dark, deep, midnight blue sky, you play with the light of the universe. We lay there together until over one lip of land sun rises again, a dawn in the world we have yet to define or measure. In that cup, and the cup is a poem, we live with the light, we live with the words of our own and others making. What is the poem inside our breathing? Breathing. Repeat the word breathing slowly until no more utterance is possible. No more breath remains. So let's return there to the regular clusteries and the Baltimore porches. No, further back, Noel. When you swung a bat like an ax and laughed low and long, not loud, but the laugh included us all. You, me, the water, the ducks, Ben, Justin, and the music. But it wasn't your heart in that power swing. You were made for the poem, not the one written down but the one inside what was written down, inside what will ever be written down. So though you passed at the young age of 30, you did not pass at all. The song does not burn, the song does not pass, the poem passes to the ages and I will help carry you and that swing and that laugh into the next river, into the still falling water, the pushing, falling, deeply rolling waters. Spring must have sprung, as in my house I am dancing and singing loudly to Dylan's knocking on heaven's door, but it's not too dark to see. And writing this poem, which keeps all of those spinning things spinning, drying the drenched shoes and socks and searching for the saints, yes, those saints, Saint Rate and Saint Range, Saint and BP and all of the northern and southern lights with Saint Francis among the daffodils. Though here it's irises and roses, I rises and I rose among the wildflowers on the other side. Not too dark, but too bright at times. To see the sun in the desert relents in the night and we sleep within the music, the desert music, the insensate music where the dance begins and we attend 
bound into a whole by the poem that surrounds us. And that will be continued after the interlude of madrigals, mad and regal, mindful and rugged, mass of right angles. Shake the flowers until the petals blue and white fall to earth. But what goes on above? Another young hawk after we had thought the loss of the last one might be the end of the nest in our tree high above the flower petals. We have had hawks for a few years now. Their sad babies cry for food and stern parental cries of warning. The poem in the tree and the hawks in the tree are the same thing. It is all the same fabric, if not the same weave. The big tent, if not the same gospel song sung, no revival, for there has been no ebb tide, no loss. Dive in, or wade in, or fall into the water. Look up at the Aleppo pine. Know the colors of yellow, green, and blue. Our eyesight measures the distance. The elements measure our eyes. And we know love is to reason as eyes to mind, which gets us halfway there. The rest is act, playing the changes. As the past weekend, we heard Mingus's changes with piano, trumpet, saxophone, drums, and bass in a collective otherness, not unison, but excess, and wandering in the same time and tongue, weather and water. Whereas once a wing and a word, a wave and a way, blue and gray, on a coast of dreams, two coasts, more dreams, among the seals in cold waters, healed in cold waters, knelt in cold waters, or in a large hand lifted up with others, other peoples and rocks and plants and animals. We share the hand, hear the bands wrap around each other, dance into some new measure, some variable line. Always columns growing on paper, like stacks of buildings or stacks of smoke in an autumn sky. These we make to find home, the home also, the poem. These we make to warm together, to warm you of the bright and muted and ever-changing colors, to join words to what you bring, to bring words to what you join. Words in columns, words in waves, words in clouds, words in communion, words in words, in words as though one might unfold the world there and there and there as though one could begin to be inside the word inside the poem, inside that love incarnate, where carnate is a series of seven letters, seven columns of lines, arrangements of lines in communion, in folds, in common, in folds and in fields. One feels with a foot, a path, a present, a participle, presently with parrots. This, that word, begins to sound like an interlude. And remember the hedgehogs, hardly hedgehogs, form and from an earlier pushing water. Not the last pushing water, but sometimes before the disease, sometime before the house became a place for two, now two others off in the world, the wave, the enunciated word. Funny to think, though, of being alone on a small planet where one thing connects to another and to all. All the young dudes, all the young falls, young winters, young springs, old summers, in place losing its waters, losing one's waters as losing one's mind, getting too dark to see. Oh, that again. Start it over. Kick it, kick it, kick it, can't afford a ticket. Listen at the wall, the home run wall, the concert hall wall, the border wall. If limits are what we are all inside, what are borders, or are there borders, or anyone might make a line, a line that becomes a border. But a line is just an infinity of points that might dissolve or must dissolve. Maybe enough water will fall to dissolve the lines. Dissolve as in, gather and disperse, contract and release. A walk in the canyon where we see the dissolved rubies, the sand rubies, Bring your face closer, your eyes closer in the sand near the water, not the last or least. Some comfort in the flow of wetness, some gathering, some hand holding it all. 
like the hand of the dark woman in the Safeway grocery store who asked me what I do. And when I said I am a poet, she reached into her bag to hand me a poem of her own. Because poetry is everywhere, certainly in the carts and bags of the dark women in the grocery stores who have heard the hawks and the horn sounds of psalms and loves, supreme and echoing in the wounds of those who return and in the wounds of those who do not return. Do you see the water of the fountain flowing over the edge of the concrete in a thin sheet you can push your hand through and feel what was there and what will be there in the next wet place, perhaps the last wet place to push through, to walk in, to rest the poem where it might open to water, air, and light. Thank you. I have a comment. Yeah. Um, right now, Lion's Roar, which is a Buddhist publication, is putting on the Women's Wisdom Summit. Right? And there are all these talks you can listen to, it's free. You know, or you can give them money, or it's free. And uh, last night I listened to one about the body. And it was so interesting, because she's talking exactly about what you're saying, how your body, your physicality encompasses all of your ancestors, every single one back through time. You don't even know. And their, their experiences, what they learn, where they walk, the, their feeling of the sun on their back, or all those things are things that you, you hold. And I thought it was... It was a meditation, and it sounded a little, whoa. And then it was like, oh, that's, a, that's great, because you know it anyway in a weird, intuitive way. You kind of know those things. But I thought it was such a beautiful image. Mm. And you're, then you're writing this, which is summoning these women into now, which I think is so, so important. Oh, yeah, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it makes me think of one of the, um, the poems uh, is uh, you know, evokes a, a Henrietta Lacks. I don't know if you know about Henrietta's story and uh, HeLa cells, but all of us, if we've got a COVID shot, for example, have HeLa cells. Um, but yeah, and apparently if you like put them all together now, how many times that they've been reproduced against her knowledge initially. And they, her family just had a settlement in August uh, of this year. So finally, um, you know, this woman who was, you know, reproducing her cells, um, unbeknownst to her and could be wrapped like six times around the earth or something like that, you know, um, yeah, that their, their family uh, is getting some sort of acknowledgement of that contribution. But like so many, so you now know, we're all related. We're all related, yeah. <laughs> we all have, <laughs> we all have the, yeah. Um, the Our cells molecules are all mixed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. a dream I have. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. That's wonderful. I, I don't have a lot of experience with mediums. I mean, I've read some people and I, you know, I taught Hildegard of Bing the other day. <laughs> but, uh, but one early experience that has stuck with me was I was about 19 years old and uh, a, a woman with white hair dressed all in black dropped things she was carrying and so I picked them up for her and then opened the door she was going to for her. And then I thought, okay, but she just looked back at me and she said, the witches will always be with you. And I think they have been. <laughs> so I think, I think people on the street sometimes are mediums. I think people, you know, they never would. People in the grocery store showing you their poem. Well, I love, you know, the mediums, like what you, you're, um, yeah, maybe this is my question to you, I guess it's just made me think of, um, like when you said that the what's inside of the poem, and then you said what's inside of the word, and I was like, oh well, that it feels like so resonant with like the way that I've been thinking about medium and just yeah, that well we think we have this thing, and you call the the cup of uh, the the cup the of cup. poem, and yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I mean I'm, I mean I have that experience with poems I read. I mean, sometimes feel like I'm, I'm inside them. The kind of way I want, I want to write with that possibility, mm. and um, and also, you know, I mean, I, I don't know about you, when I, I when I one thing I love about poetry, as opposed to.
fiction, and I apologize to all you fiction writers, and most fiction, not all, usually have a story that comes to an end. I don't like coming to an end. <laughs> As your great patients listen to me not coming to an end forever and ever. And thank you for that patience too. I, I really want to read that piece in part because one almost never gets to read a piece that long in a, in a poetry reading with other people. Poets need to hear themselves too. It's weird. You know? Thank you. Masha? Uh, I have a question. It's more on the level to be sure. Uh -huh. okay. mm -hmm. um, so it's not that a sprinkle of years of us, you know, do that. How did you choose who to who to be here? Yeah. Really good question. Yeah. Um, yeah, it had to be by chance. You know, chance of just my own, but a chance rooted in, you know, the how you know, that chance is determined by my very specific, you know, circumstances, my own, you know, my own body, my own time, my own, you know, the, the books that are on my shelf, um, the conversations that I had, you know, so um, I just had to embrace at a certain point because, you know, um, you know, like so many projects, um, right, like, you, you know, once you get this, uh, an idea, you can see all, all the many, many various ways that it could go. And um, so that happened to me, and then so very early on, I realized, okay, well, there's going to have to be, <laughs> you know, um, a, a constraint, and that constraint, you know, um, I, I, I did just have to embrace at a certain point was you know, my own subjectivity and the sort of chance meanderings through um, history books and conversations, and um, you know, um, my own sort of pinging thoughts. Did, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, I love all the readings today. Thank you, Cole. Um, the, I, I think a lot about like poetry as mediation and like like when both when you're writing and as a reader or as like a listener and, and so I think about like even just hearing both of you read now, like by listening, I'm mediating, like I'm a, I'm a medium, I become that for both of you. Like for whatever you're reading, mm. and and Johanna specifically, I had a question. Um, like when you're writing for so many of us and you're thinking of the process of like mediating these these people, um, what is what is it like in that moment of composition for you when you're like? Is it akin to a performance or acting where you think you're kind of channeling that person in a performance aspect, or is there? Is there something you're listening for, or you know, what is that like? For you? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, I don't know if I have the answer for it because I mean, because I feel like I could ask you to describe your moment of composition, and you might have just as much difficulty, right? Like just trying to tease out like what is really going on there. But I think, and I don't have. Um, you know, any really at all, you know, uh, really acting uh, um, training or um, experience. Um, but I, I can kind of imagine that maybe like there's an element of it of just like taking on the a, a character because any performance explorations I've done have been in clowning, which is I think to a certain extent, but there's like performers here that could like correct me. But my sense is, is like, and what I got interested in that was like, well, you know, when um, when I was told, okay, it's not necessarily about being funny, but um, making oneself vulnerable and making direct contact for the audience. So that was like what set me off and running, thinking about. So I, so to me, like that element is very much like what the um, the craft for me of poetry or the act of poetry is like, just trying to just like be whatever it means to be like open and vulnerable and like um, right past the self or however that's happening in the moment um, that that's uh, so that's kind of but but I see it also with the persona poems that there is an element that I imagine 
um, you know, is more akin to like when you're really, you know, trying to, no, I'm going to convey this character and now I need to learn this character and I need to, so I think that there, yeah, that the, the two kind of met and intertwined where, and I guess that's what I was trying to say when I was saying that like the, the, the book is as much about distances as potential or, you know, actual certainly proximities. Um, so kind of like leaning into that in the, um, the process of writing as well. Um, kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, knowing that I'm not going to be able to avoid that distance um, and, um, and, and sort of taking my own sort of my, my own angle in whatever learnings I had. I just immersed myself in a lot of like biographies and histories of these, these folks. And uh, um, so there, there, there was that sort of that, that very external slant at the same time that as much as I could, I tried to like tie it into that, that vulnerability and just like opening of self. So uh, yeah, both. <laughs> Thanks for the question.